Good afternoon. My name is Robert Dijkgraaf. I'm the director and Leon Levy professor at the Institute for Advanced Study. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this Institute lecture. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Michael van Walt van Praag. He's a visiting professor in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute, working in modern international relationships and international law. And in some sense, this is a, a, a second chance to give this lecture because the first one we tried was actually a, a horrible storm that interfered. And I think the weather gods today tried, but they didn't succeed. So I'm very happy that uh, you're all here. Uh, this lecture should be placed in uh, a fine tradition that's here at the Institute on uh, having scholars working on the interface, so to say, of the academic and the diplomatic world, the world of policy and conflicts, not that, of course, that the academic world is devoid of that. You know the famous words of Henry Kissinger that said, who said that university politics made him long for the simplicity of the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> But um, I think uh, our speaker today uh, is uh, particularly you know, positioned to talk about some of these aspects. He truly is, in some sense, a, a global citizen, a uh, son of diplomats. Michael was brought up in Hong Kong, New Zealand, in Rome, and he holds both a doctorate and a degree in international law from, and here I actually can use our little secret language, from the Rijksuniversiteit Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, which was in some sense the brief period that you actually, uh, uh, although you're a Dutch citizen, you were actually in our country. Then he has worked in many different capacities and functions. Uh, famously also, he has served as the international legal advisor to the Dalai Lama, helping to navigate the dialogue with China. But his work as an international lawyer and advocate has spread far beyond Tibet. He has served as a mediator and advisor to negotiation parties in the South Pacific, in the Caucasus, Asia and Africa, basically everywhere in the world. Also important from 91 to 98, he served as general secretary of the Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization, which gives a voice to groups unrepresented in international fora, such as the United Nations. In 1999, he founded CREDA, the International Peace Council for States, Peoples and Minorities where he continues to serve as an executive president. And Credit's name means to place trust. It's an international non-governmental organization that seeks to prevent, manage, and resolve conflicts between population groups and states. All of these efforts have been rewarded uh, with many prizes and honors. I just mentioned the Ramon Lul International Prize and the World Gratitude Prize for Peace. He's the author of many books and articles, including two books about the status of Tibet and two on conflict resolutions. He also had vis various visiting academic positions at Stanford, at Berkeley, Indiana, the Nero University in India, and the Golden Gate University School of Law. In 2011, Michael started his three-year tenureship as visit visiting professor uh, at the Institute. Now, the remarkable thing about his work is that, as I said, apart from being on the interface of the academic and the politics world, is that a large part of it is in some sense invisible because everything he does is very much confidential and based on confidence, building confidence. So it's kind of behind closed doors, behind the screens. And that means that last work, basically what has been doing the last 15 years, is kind of a world we do not read about. In many ways, uh, his success is measured in terms of the conflicts that do not appear and do not surface in the, on the headlines in the newspapers. And so in that sense, it's wonderful that here at the Institute we can offer him an opportunity to kind of investigate this issue also from an academic perspective. And Michael's actually working with a group of uh, 60 people internationally, looking at, uh, from various uh, disciplines, looking at the role of the perception of common history in conflicts and peace processes, from the, ranging from the 12th to the 20th century. And so questions that he asks is how do these narratives develop, how are they hindering or helping conflict resolution. So in some sense, he's still doing his work as mediator, but now as a mediator in history. Uh, all of this will be addressed in uh, today's lecture with the title, When Truth Gets in the Way, Addressing Multiple Realities in Interstate Conflicts. And as always, after the lecture, we'll have time for questions, and then we invite you to continue the conversation at the reception in the common room. But please now join me in welcoming Michael van Walt van Praag to the stage. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Dijkhaaf. Thank you, Robert, for this very extensive introduction. And thank you all for coming this afternoon. Indeed, despite at least the beginning of bad weather. Most days, when we pick up the newspaper or watch the news, we're confronted with stories and images of violent conflict. But what we see in the media is but a meager reflection of what is out there. Most violent conflicts, and particularly the lower intensity ones, are rarely covered by mainstream media. What is portrayed in the media when conflicts are reported on is the fighting, the casualties, and perhaps the main events of the day. What we hear much less about is what happens at the negotiations table, as the leaders work on ending conflict and create their blueprints for the future. This is understandable since most of the progress that takes place in peace talks and most of the talks themselves is only seen behind closed doors and the public is informed only through carefully prepared statements and staged photographs. My comments today deal with a particular aspect of what happens at the negotiating table. But before I delve into that, let me say a few words on the nature of the conflicts and the peace processes I will be talking about today. The vast majority of violent or potentially violent conflicts today are intrastate in nature. In other words, they occur within sovereign states as opposed to between them. The conflicts in Syria, Mali, Darfur, and the Sudan are examples of that. Although some are internationalized, their origins are still intrastate and their nature is not necessarily changed. The kind of intrastate conflict I have experience with and that is relevant to my comments today is that between the central government of a state and a population group within the state, usually a distinct people or minority. Such conflicts are identity-based and parties fight over the exercise of authority, for example, in the political, economic, or uh, cultural spheres. They fight over control over territory, natural resources, over the environment, security matters, and more broadly, over autonomy, and sometimes over independence. Think of the current or recent conflicts between Turkey and the Kurds, good article today in the New York Times, Georgia and the Abkhaz, Indonesia and the Achenese, Sri Lanka and the Tamils, Philippine government and the Moro of Mindanao, Myanmar and the Kachin or Karen, Morocco and the Sahrawi of Western Sahara, Spain and the Basques, to mention about a few that I'm sure you're familiar with. Now, the other kind of intrastate conflict in the world today is one in which the government of a state is pitted against an opposition group vying for government power, as we've seen in Syria, Libya, Kenya, Sierra Leone. This kind of conflict is not the focus of my remarks today. The parties to the conflict come to the negotiating table for the most part when both sides realize that they can't win militarily and that they can't achieve what they want without the cooperation of the other party. Negotiations typically deal with a wide array of issues, ranging from the conclusion of ceasefires to the distribution of political power, from military issues to territorial claims or the exploitation of natural resources. They deal with the creation of autonomous regions, with redistribution of economic resources, with constitutional reform, and so on. And these constitute the substance of the negotiations. Process issues are those that affect the ability of the negotiators to address the substance. Think, for example, of the way the agenda is set, the format of the talks, and the conduct of negotiation sessions. The atmospherics of the meeting, the dynamics of the interactions between the delegations, both formal and informal, emotions, tensions, moments of relaxation, all of these are very important for the course of the negotiations. One issue in intrastate negotiations that manifests both as an issue of substance and an issue of process is what one might call the history factor. <laughs> 
In some peace processes, an important episode of history or its interpretation is on the table for discussion as part of the agenda. And it's therefore an issue of substance. Think of the past wars and conquests, disputed annexations of territory, population transfers, alleged promises made during decolonization processes, disputes over non-implementation of agreements, etc. But history, or more accurately, the perception of history of the parties, also affects the process in the negotiations. Although perhaps less tangible than the concrete issues of substance, perceptions of history as well as the, the perceptions um, uh, through which historical narratives are created can play a fundamental, albeit sometimes subliminal role in the success or failure of peace processes. I have sat in many negotiation rooms and bombed out government buildings in tents and hotel rooms with the leaders of conflicting parties or shuttled between them month after year, month and sometimes year after year in various capacities to help them make peace. And I've come to the conclusion that the underlying historical issues need to be addressed more effectively than has usually been the case. And this brings me to the topic of this lecture. I will start by sharing with you how perceptions of history affect interstate peace negotiations and why this is so important to seriously address them. I will then describe and explain the main features of an approach I'm working on for effectively doing so. In short, the approach requires that we bring about a fundamental change in the way negotiators view the nature of the other side's historical narrative as well as their own. I propose to do this by placing things in their broader contexts. And I will conclude today's lecture with some remarks on the relations between the nation-state paradigm, conflicts, and their resolution. I wish to point out at this point that this is the product of much teamwork with Mick Boltius, who, to whom I'm very thankful for it as well. Perception of history affect intrastate peace talks in a number of ways. Conflicting parties, and more especially their leaders and the representatives sitting at the negotiating table, sometimes articulate their claims on the basis of historical arguments or use such arguments to bolster their positions as, for example, both sides did in the Kosovo negotiations. Some parties bluntly demand that the other side accept their version of history, in extreme cases even as a precondition to substantive talks. Others do not bring up history at all and even suggest that it remain off the table. In some cases, an event, a development or a relationship in history is itself an agenda item for negotiation and resolution. West Papuans, for example, want the events surrounding the so-called act of free choice by which they were to determine their own status and destiny in 1969 under UN supervised process, but which in fact led to their incorporation into Indonesia under highly questionable circumstances to be on the agenda of negotiations with the Indonesian government. But whether history is invoked explicitly or not, the party's perception or experience of history is a fundament on which they base their sense of entitlement, build their claims and expectations, and develop their positions. At the negotiating table, history must perhaps be understood less as the discussion about events that took place in the past and more as an experience in the present. History indeed is palpably present in the negotiation room and one doesn't need to be clairvoyant to sense that. Especially in identity-based conflicts, profound historical consciousness resides at the core of the conflict. Here, group, ethnic and national identities are inextricably intertwined with historical narrative, the sense of truth of which animates emotions of pride, injustice, victimization, loss, anger, righteousness, 
The justice and injustice of past actions is felt and argued by each side on the basis of respective understandings of history. And all this is part of the rationale and justification for going to war and the cause for which people are expected to give their lives and take those of others. In negotiations to end such conflicts, the opposing parties' perceptions of history, especially with regard to their past relationships, often clash. Each side views the experience and relates differently to what may appear to outsiders to be a common history. Negotiators on either side of the table do not just tell their version of history as if they were two sides of the same coin. Usually there's much more going on. Each side has a very different story based on different sources, grounded in different values, and often springing from different worldviews. And so we're frequently dealing with two completely different experiences, different perceptions and entirely different stories that lead in the mind of their protagonists to different and at times irreconcilable entitlements today. There are new, numerous examples of this. The perception of the Abkhaz and the Georgian authorities, of Kabindan and Angolan negotiators, of Bougainvillian and Papua New Guinean parties, to mention but a few, reflect these kinds of differences of story. Today, I select that of the ongoing negotiations to end a half century of armed conflict between the government of India and the Naga independence movement to illustrate the point because of its relative simplicity, devoid of some of the complicating factors and actors often found in our other interstate conflicts, but also because it's a case that you may not be that familiar with. I should note that the territory claimed by the Naga movement is much larger than the current state of Nagaland and is of immense strategic importance as it borders China, Myanmar, Burma, Bangladesh, and it's India's gateway to Southeast Asia. High-level negotiations between the government of India and the leaders of the main armed Naga independence movement cover a wide range of political, economic, territorial, and defense matters. Each side's approach, claims, and positions flow from the different perceptions each has of Indian and Naga history. The Indian government takes colonial British Indian authority as a historical point of departure and professes to have inherited from the rule of the British colonial administration the right to rule the Naga territories and population. It consequently, consequently considers the constitution of India as the only plausible framework for a settlement. And within that context, is well prepared to transfer some powers from the Union government to the Nagaland state, that is, to the local government. The Nagas, on the other hand, emphasize their separate existence in history and their distinct identity as the basic approach and consider the status quo, including the Nagaland state boundaries, as illegitimate. They invoke history to assert Nagas were never ruled as part of India and from that vantage point propose a voluntary federation with India. Now, despite 13 years of talks, the parties have not been able to bridge the gap between these two fundamentally different approaches, which in my opinion is one of the main reasons why that conflict is not resolved to this day. It's easy to trivialize arguments put forth by negotiating parties on the basis of history, to brush them aside as mere narratives especially if the parties invoke things that took place centuries ago or use sources and accounts that may be culture-specific or that we are unfamiliar with and that we don't think are credible. We're prone to reject apparent and sometimes blatant attempts to selectively use historical arguments for political gain. And when one of the parties themselves suggests that history be left for what it is and not discussed, while the other insists on its importance, we are tempted to agree with the first and seemingly more reasonable view. But before we jump to such conclusions, we need to understand that explicitly expressed or not, the experience or perception of history of each of the parties and their conviction that this represents the truth 
informs their beliefs, their identity, their sense of righteousness and entitlement, and this in turn permeates the agenda of talks, their respective positions, their demands, and their arguments. And this will not change by not addressing the issue of history. Quite the contrary. And this is the first point that I wanted to make. We know that because perceptions of historical truths are closely linked to the party's engagement and commitment to the objectives they fought for, it's very hard for political leaders and negotiators to let go of the views on history that they hold. How do we address them? And by the way, I use the word party fully conscious that I'm presenting in this respect a highly simplified picture. Clearly, we're all aware that when we talk about a party or a side in relation to a conflict or to a negotiation process, what we are really dealing with is a complexity of institutions, groups and individuals, each with their own backgrounds, interests and fears, each with their distinct cultures and dynamics, and each with their own experience of history. The role of the individual and various kinds of interest groups, of course, is enormously important in understanding conflicts, but also negotiation processes. For purpose of this lecture, I use party as a shorthand for these assortments of actors on each side of the conflict negotiation, and imagine them as being represented by the leaders and spokespersons that actively negotiate and interact with each other in the peace process. And also, when I refer to negotiate, negotiators in this lecture, I refer specifically to the individuals that negotiate in these processes. Now, if it were possible for us to enable negotiators to understand and respect the historical narrative of the other side, without having to accept or endorse it, just acknowledge it, this would diffuse or take the edge off the hold that their own version of history has on them. And achieving this, in my opinion, requires bringing about a change in the way parties view each other's as well as their own historical perceptions. And for this to have the desired positive effect on the negotiation process, the negotiators on both sides of the conflict need to experience such a change. And this is the second point I wanted to make. And I'd like to dwell on it for a moment, if you will. Because what we're looking for are ways to trigger a shift of perception of reality in a negotiator. A shift from the belief that only one narrative of history can be true to the insight that there may also be other plausible views that are valid. The moment in which the person gets the world view and the other realities from which the other's historical interpretations and narratives spring, that moment, that moment of realization is a point of no return in some sense, because it takes away the absolute truth experience in relation to the negotiator's own belief and conditioning. It's an experience the negotiator cannot undo and one that reveals the relative nature of historical truths. Now, it's important to stress here that what we're looking for is not a denial of one or the other narrative, nor is it necessary to agree on a common narrative, as Elazar Barkan's work has shown. In fact, historical narratives are important to the sense of identity of a people or a community and contribute to social cohesion, to nation building or state building, and to stability, if channeled positively. Rather, what I'm proposing is to bring about those transformative moments of realization which free the negotiators to get on with the task they're there to do, namely, to negotiate a package that serves their constituency's interests. And they can now do that because a major element of the emotional charge has been removed. Of course, there may be other emotionally charged issues, such as how the parties treat each other today, but the historical narrative touches 
the essence of people's perception of who they are. Their sense of their own identity. If, you're f if you are being challenged with respect to who you are, to the legitimacy of your identity, the legitimacy of you, both personally and as a group, chances are this unleashes an emotional reaction in you. It's an emotional reaction that disables negotiators from effectively ad addressing the agenda items before them on their merits. This, I believe, is not routinely acknowledged nor appropriately addressed in interstate peace processes, including by mediators. Perhaps because it always seems other matters are more pressing, but more likely because it is difficult to engage negotiators in discussions about interpersonal dynamics at the negotiation table. After all, they didn't sign up for a therapy session. At the same time, any mediator who has been deeply involved in peace processes will tell you that the success of a peace process is much more dependent on the individuals involved and on the dynamics and relationships that develop between them than we are led to believe or might want to believe. Ultimately, it's a few people that must make it happen. If negotiators on both sides of the table have experienced that moment of getting the other's perspective on the contested aspects of history, a situation will have been created in which they no longer feel personally challenged in the core of who they are, and they can focus on the task at hand professionally, acting in the role they were mandated to play. Now, apart from affecting the interpersonal dynamics at the negotiation table, such a shift or resistance to it can potentially affect the course of negotiations in more substantive ways as well. It can bring about a number of plausible scenarios, some of which may lead to a turning point. Now, you may think at this point that I'm somewhat naive. Surely, many political leaders and negotiators know better than to believe their and their party's historical narratives, which they use as nothing more than an instrument to achieve their political ends. I'll not venture to estimate the relative number of leaders and negotiators who believe their historical narratives as opposed to those who do not. But I'll say this, that in my own modest experience, most of those I have known and worked with are indeed convinced of the truth of their history and their story, their narrative as indeed so many of us accept to a greater or to a lesser degree the versions of history we're taught at school, by our parents, by elders, not to mention the media. The distinction whether the negotiators do or do not believe their own historical narrative is of course very important and may well become apparent precisely by pursuing the kind of analysis that we're talking about. For if a negotiator insists on the absolute and exclusive truth of his party's narrative and continues to demand that the other party accept it, despite evidence supporting the validity of other approaches and interpretations or despite the exposure of serious flaws and fabrications in his party's own narrative, such behavior tells us something important. It can indicate the absence of political will to resolve the conflict, in which case the insistence on the historical arguments is most probably an excuse not to deal with other issues. It can also expose a strategy to achieve a political goal considered to be more important than reaching a negotiated solution. Some state, but also non-state actors, insist on their version of history for example, because they seek to derive legitimacy from it for an authority that they've established over others by military force. This is especially the case where other sources of legitimacy are absent or wanting, which might be apparent where the population in question, for example, visibly resists or rejects their authority. The Chinese government's insistence in official talks with Tibetan negotiators and in communications to the world on the absolute truth of its historical narrative by which Tibetans have been a part of the Chinese nation since ancient times might well be an example of this. <laughs> 
The detection of a lack of political will or of the existence of strategies potentially incompatible with negotiated solutions to a conflict is a very important outcome of the process of addressing history with the parties. The question of how serious a party is in wanting to resolve a conflict, that is, whether it has the political will to give and take to reach an agreement, is a fundamental and critical question for the mediator and, of course, for the opposing party. As long as the answer to that question isn't known, and it can be very difficult to uncover, the peace process is, in some sense, in limbo, and the situation on the ground remains unresolved. Other outcomes of such a process of analysis um, and addressing history can be the exposure and subsequent admission of serious flaws, perhaps, or falsifications in a rendition of history. Or it could be an agreement between the parties or the negotiators to leave history out of the text of an, of an eventual agreement and to focus instead on the future and on the needs of the parties in the future. But the process can also lead to a decision to explicitly address history and a joint statement or even a draft text might be prepared uh, concerning this issue in a way that satisfies each party. This enables the negotiators to get on with tackling other issues on the agenda unencumbered by the weight, as it were, of the historical question. There we go. In a mediation we conducted in New Caledonia between the parties one being the government, the other the indigenous Kanak population, and the third a transnational mining company, parties did just that. Very much was at stake for all concerned, but the negotiations were stuck until we drafted a preamble for the future agreement it was hoped that the parties would reach, in which those aspects of the historical narratives important to each of the parties was reflected. Once the negotiators agreed on the draft, the process moved quickly on the political, economic, environmental, and other issues. Because one of the parties, the Kanaks, had obtained the respect and recognition of their history on which, in their minds, all other points hinged. And because the historical events of importance to the other parties was also reflected as they saw them. Now, negotiators may fear that by engaging in historical analysis, both the historical arguments they put forward and the claims based on them could be negatively, negatively affected and thus make it more difficult for them to achieve what they want. Such fears may be justified for claims based on historical narratives that are largely fabricated or result from such an extreme degree of selectiveness and distortion of past reality that their arguments would not stand any reasonable analysis. They're also justified if a claim's validity is entirely dependent on a historical argument. For example, if it's based solely on the alleged conclusion of a treaty between the actors of whom the parties are professed to be the rightful successors. But except for this sort of case, there is no reason that a claim or demands themselves would be significantly adversely affected if these embody important needs and interests of the party rather than solely a vindication of history. For example, where the demand of a party for a share in the revenues of mineral extraction is supported by considerations of fairness of wealth distribution or tied to demands for the devolution of political and economic power, the validity of those claims are not dependent on the historical argument, even though those arguments may animate and fuel the sense of righteousness to those claims by the one party and the sense of outrage about those same claims by the other. It seems to me, in fact, that most claims made by parties in interstate conflicts are not dependent on historical argument for their validity. And as long as historical claims and arguments made by a party are not recognized or even rejected by the other party, 
Those arguments carry no weight in the negotiations towards achieving that party's goal anyway. And so it's a fallacy to think that the negotiator's new understanding of history that he might achieve through this kind of analysis, and therefore his understanding of the relative nature of narratives, would weaken that party's position on valid claims vis-a-vis -vis the other party. Because before the change of view took place, the historical belief or argument that the negotiator possessed had no impact on the other side's feeling about the claims put forward, since that version of history on, it would, on which it was based was rejected by that other party. So it would have had no mileage, if you like, in the negotiations. Now, instead, it may in fact have some mileage at the negotiation table, precisely because it's been released from the contamination of the contested historical narrative. Now, change of view of negotiators may also affect the broader political field outside of the negotiation venue. This is a different issue, but a very important one, and I'll return briefly to it at the end of my remarks. Here I'm arguing that a fundamental change in the way negotiators are able to look at their history and that of the other side will help them to negotiate a peace agreement that can satisfy their constituents' need more effectively. And the principal question or questions left before us then are, one, how we engage on this subject with negotiators and achieve the changes of view that can produce the desired effect in terms of facilitating the negotiation process. And two, how we address historical events, developments, and interpretations that are themselves on the table as subjects to be negotiated. And I propose that concrete events, as well as historical narratives and the historiography from which they emerge, be placed in context in a number of ways, a couple of which I'll briefly touch upon. I use the term historical narrative, narrative of history, or simply narrative, to mean the story or stories that parties to conflicts believe in and propagate regarding their history and the history of their relations with each other and with others. These stories reveal their perception, their understanding of their history, and in some sense are an expression of it. Now, some narratives are developed for purposes of mobilizing support for a particular conflict. Or they developed against the perceived or fabricated threat. And some are created to fuel xenophobic, racist, or extreme nationalist agendas. Now, such narratives also need to be addressed, especially if they significantly impact the beliefs and state of mind of the negotiators and their constituents but they need to be understood for what they are and addressed as such by the mediator without adding credibility to them in the process. However significant the emergence and use of these kinds of narratives are, they're not the focus of my inquiry here. The narratives we're most concerned with here are those rooted in the past and bound to perceptions of history that have existed for some time and are not just created for these specific purposes I mentioned. In order to understand and address these historical narratives and the perceptions they're based on, it's necessary to understand the history as well as the origins and developments of the historiography from which these narratives emerged. And the relationship between the narratives and the historiography is very close and is something we need to be uh, aware of as we contextualize both. Narratives are the outcome of selecting events, episodes, and developments from the past and stringing them together in an explanation that serves the purpose of the present. Of course, all stories and all historical narratives are formed through a process of selection and interpretation of information, and none of them tell the whole truth. This is also true of scholarly historiography, as many of my colleagues here know. But in conflict situations, the selectiveness tends to be particularly pronounced, leaving aside the interpretation parties give to past events. The events they invoked are themselves selected to support their narratives 
and are isolated both spatially and temporally from other events and developments that could poten potentially shed a different light on them and provide different explanations for them. If properly done, the mediator team can engage negotiators in discussions of history in ways that help them see the greater picture in which each of their stories live. The point being, as the well-known parable of the blind men and the elephant tells us, that making the bigger picture visible to negotiators reveals the relative nature of their perceptions. The process of contextualizing and experiencing more of the whole story, as it were, can bring awareness of the effect the selectiveness of their narratives has on, the re on their reading of history and may create a space to also receive information that does not form part of the narratives they know. Let me try to illustrate this. In the mid-1990s, Russian leaders and their representatives negotiating in Grozny to end the first of the devastating wars between Chechnya and Russia, focused on the Chechens taking advantage of Russia's temporary turbulence and weakness to separate from Russia, and saw it as a product of the centrifugal forces that resulted in the breakup of the Soviet Union and the conflicts that followed. They built a narrative around those events to which they added the threat of Islamic fundamentalism and the inherent treachery of Chechens as evidenced already in the past in their opposition to the Soviet Union at the start of World War II. Chechens, on the other hand, saw their struggle as a long and historic one against an imperial tyrant and its successor regimes for which their ancestors gave their lives and their parents were deported to Central Asia. According to their narrative, which starts centuries ago, there is consistency, heroism, victimization, and the nobility of persistent and principled struggles for freedom. Here is the picture of President Johar Dudayev, taken in front of the painting of Sheikh Mansur, in the presidential palace in Grozny around 1994, just before um, the Russians launched the war uh, in Chechnya. Although Sheikh Mansur's famous victory of, over Catherine the Great's forces took place in the late 18th century, he remains to this day the symbol of Chechen identity and unity in heroic resistance. Now the identification with this historic figure and all that he represents speaks volumes of the way Dudayev saw and projected himself, and how he and many Chechens saw the struggle they engaged in with Russia as the continuum of a long conflict already waged by their ancestors. In order to understand the confounding wars between the Russian forces and the Chechens in the 1990s, and to appreciate the significance of these divergent narratives, and the claims that both put forward. It's of course necessary to understand the dynamics at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union, the nature of Soviet nationalities policy and relations between the Chechens and the Soviet authorities, including Stalin, decades earlier. And also, it is important to understand it in the connection of the interactions between Tsarist Russian Empire and the Chechens. So these and other aspects all contribute to the bigger picture in which the narratives of each side need to be placed in discussions with them in order to trigger the awareness in the minds of the negotiators of the nature and limitations of their narratives, including their biases and possible distortions, but equally of their relative validity when taken out of isolation and placed in the larger context. Okay, moving on to the next point, let's take a look at the production of history um, of, of historical writing, production of historiography, and how investigating this may also help to re release the hold narratives have on negotiators. Histories have been written for the purposes of record keeping, 
intellectual pursuit and education, but also for the aggrandizement of emperors, kings, military rulers, and religious rulers and leaders, to justify wars, territorial aggrandizement, to impose religions, to establish civilizational superiority, and to promote, to promote national cohesion. Throughout history, rulers and other leaders have used the writing, the rewriting of history, as a means to obtain or enhance legitimacy for their position as well as for their ambitions. These histories, records, accounts, and even correspondence are a product of the time, place, and circumstances in which they were produced. And covering the purposes for which what we now call source materials were produced in the past is essential to understanding what those sources tell us about the past. And historians are, of course, par excellence qualified to make such an analysis and also to distinguish rhetoric from representations of reality in the sources they analyze. But in peace talks, this kind of critical analysis of sources that, inf that inform the party's perception is lacking, or mostly lacking. And it is this examination that I propose negotiation teams should undertake, or at least be exposed to. Now let's not forget that current interpretations of historical occurrences are of course also conditioned by the political, institutional, and other circumstances in which historians work today, as well as their language and other skills. So we need to appreciate that this also informs the perception of history of parties today, as well as our own. In sum, recognizing the importance of the context in which histories were created, as well as why and how they were written, used, modified, or rewritten, can help reveal the nature of the narratives they have generated and demystify the notion that these histories tell the truth. And this, in turn, can potentially reduce the hold that they have on the parties in conflicts today. Engaging negotiators and political leaders in the kind of historical discussion I propose can, of course, be a major challenge. Some will feel there's no time for such discussions, but more importantly, by agreeing to such a process, negotiators venture in uncharted terrain and feel vulnerable, both vis-a-vis -vis the other side and vis-a-vis -vis their own constituencies. These are tough challenges, of course, which need to be taken into account and, where possible, mitigated. But strategies for this are best developed on a case-by-case -case basis, because each conflict, each peace process, each of these challenges have their unique characteristics and dynamics, cultural settings, and yes, histories, and the individuals involved, their own personalities, and their capabilities for interacting with their constituencies. Willingness to engage in this kind of analysis will hinge on whether negotiators feel comfortable with the proposed process and see the benefit of it. And this, in turn, is influenced by the importance those engaged in peacemaking, such as mediators, diplomats, advisors, involved in this field of work, give to dealing with history. If the history factor in these interstate conflicts were routinely given careful consideration, attention, and time as part of the peacemaking effort, this would really help to condition the expectation of negotiators in this respect and augment their willingness to engage in the kind of historical discussion analysis that we're suggesting. If, moreover, conflict resolution educators and trainers would integrate the issue in their curricula, this would enable the practitioners and facilitators and mediators to approach it with confidence. And I hope that my lecture today will contribute to this notion and lead to further thought and discussion on how best to address the different facets of the history factor in interstate peace processes today. This leads me to the final part of the lecture, to some reflections on the prevalent manner in which we're conditioned to think about the central place and role of the nation state and how this affects interstate conflicts and the potential for their resolution. The practice of approaching writing history from the vantage point of today's nation state 
with its current political borders and population, and projecting that back in time to produce a history of this nation, this state, this people, can be very unhelpful. Today we refer naturally to the history of India or Turkey or China, to the history of Germany or Indonesia. And we're often implicitly led to assume that these political entities continually existed for centuries, perhaps even since antiquity. We imagine that the history we are taught is that of the same entity, the same nation, the same people, albeit known by different names and perhaps having slightly different shapes and sizes. We construct a linear string of achievements, civilizational or otherwise, which we attribute to this entity and its historical leaders. So we highlight the linkages that connect the past to the present in terms of today's nation state construct. We show how this nation state is the culmination of something that's existence, that, that has existed since the distant past on essentially the same territory most of the time because that somehow gives it legitimacy. And in the process, we're of necessity selective, ignoring things that detract or deny the continuity of the present state with the past. By doing this, we don't only distort history by placing the past in the context of today's reality. We also disable ourselves from studying, interpreting, and understanding developments in the past on their own merits and from appreciating the perception that existed at that time in their environments and contexts. And yet this is precisely what's so important when you're trying to address history in interstate conflicts and interstate peace processes. In addition, this kind of historiography tends to privilege certain population groups or peoples within the confines of today's state, principally those who are currently dominant over those who are not. Some non-dominant peoples and minorities are either retroactively included in the history of the state or even the nation, as if they had always been part of it, albeit as a subnational category, perhaps property, or perhaps a subject people of that nation. Others are virtually left out of that history. And this kind of practice can serve not only to legitimize and solidify existing power relationships, but also it affects our perception and judgment of the manner in which we approach interstate conflicts. And we shouldn't forget that this kind of historiography can also contribute to tensions and conflicts because it can be experienced as hurtful and provocative by those whose history is not given equal importance, a feeling that is reinforced when the latter claim a history of their own, quite possibly projecting their vision of the present or even future ambitions into the past using techniques that are similar to those used to create the dominant national history. But when such attempts are rejected or labeled separatist or belittled or ridiculed, it can cause additional tension. Now having said that, I wish to emphasize that just as the state or dominant group narratives can provoke tensions, so too can narrow nationalist narratives of sub-state population groups or expansionistic ones of cross-boundary population groups whose ambitions, incidentally, are often no less nation-state-centric. The inclination to think from the perception of today's nation-state paradigm, embodied in and protected by international law, also leads to a certain status quo fixation. And this is not helpful to resolving interstate conflicts as it limits our ability to imagine and craft solutions that truly address the individual causes of conflicts. We also tend to forget that some of today's interstate conflicts have causes that can be traced back to the spread or imposition of that very same nation state paradigm in large parts of the world in the 19th century and early 20th century. At that time, the new political and international legal order required that the world be entirely divided among nation states, leaving no territory and therefore no people outside this largely artificial construct. 
political communities needed to demonstrate that they were a sovereign nation state and obtain recognition of this by others or be considered part of someone else's nation state, a situation that understandably led to many conflicts. With a continued absence in most situations today of other alternatives than those of independent territorial statehood with all the perceived privileges of recognized sovereign status on the one hand and subjection to another state's sovereign authority on the other, dissatisfied non-state population groups are in effect being encouraged to struggle for independent statehood. And needless to say, this is not necessarily the best recipe and certainly not the intent of the proponents of the nation state system. The usefulness of considering alternatives, therefore, is demonstrated, among other things, by the more creative forms of autonomy, such as those of Hong Kong, Tatarstan, Catalonia, Gagauzia, Zanzibar. These and other examples, such as the Orland Islands, Greenland, South Tyrol, Toradige, and Bougainville, have worked well in many ways. But what some of these cases also show is the fragility of such autonomy arrangements when the central or the autonomous authorities assert power beyond the delicate balance that such asymmetric structures inherently possess. We therefore need to build on these positive experiences that these kinds of examples provide, but also learn from their flaws. And importantly, we also need to imagine new forms of political organization to meet the needs of multiple stakeholders and the demands and complexities of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike, for a uh, question to me for the role of the historian on the negotiating table. And you were very kindly or willing to take some questions. So I would like to open the floor for questions. Please feel free. Thank to you. I was very much involved in negotiations in the Balkans in the 90s and in the first half of the last decade, uh, working with Romanians that are Hungarian minority, with uh, Albanians in Macedonia and Montenegro and in Kosovo and Serbia. And I must say, I have a very contrary view from yours of the role of narrative. I, it seemed to me that to the extent that there was any success in Thank you very much for this very insightful, uh, insightful comment. And it's one that I recognize very much. I recognize it on different levels. Um, I recognize it because um, the comment that you make that, that many of these narratives are uh, victimization narratives or, or, um, and that uh, they all have a, a, a certain truth to them um, or that they're all true in their own way um, and that they are an impediment uh, I entirely agree with. I think there, and um, the, the um, 
objective of the approach I'm working on is not to dwell on narratives. I wouldn't use that characterization. It is to try to address them in a way that brings out their relative nature and their relative validity so that they no longer create an emotional block. In my experience, um, uh, many negotiations simply get stuck because of this um, uh, need to have one's history recognized or because of a policy that this is what one side wants or the other, one, or the other side wants. Some of the difference um, in the approaches that, uh, that one observes also have to do with the nature of the mediation, the nature of the power behind the mediation. And in some of the examples that you give or that you allude to, um, there is a fair amount of pressure from the international community on parties um, with some carrots but also some very severe sticks in case they don't move ahead and go beyond what it is that is considered an obstacle to reaching uh, an agreement. Now, in many of the mediations uh, that I've been involved in, uh, typically the mediator doesn't have this kind of, of power arsenal to work with. And so you're much more dependent on, what, on the parties driving the process as opposed to the mediator driving the process. Um, and in that, in that context in particular, um, finding ways to address these emotional blocks or these, uh, uh, these, these blockages that history form in terms of simply the, the perceptions of, of the negotiators themselves um, at the table um, is one thing that I found uh, um, uh, very relevant and very important. And the one example that I gave, and there is more of those, where um, agreeing on some type of formulation that reflects the different historical perspectives of the parties in a way that's acceptable to them can help put that aside and move exactly as you suggest to other issues, how do we get along in the future? It's, it's, uh, 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 yeah, it's just one of the possible outcomes, as I mentioned. Thank you very much, Michael, for this very illuminating talk. My, my question kind of relates to, to what, what we just heard. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate this approach of addressing the, what, what Benedict, Ender, Benedict Anderson and Eric Hobsbawm called invented traditions and to, to make people aware of these different invented traditions in this context. Though I, I see a specific dilemma in particular if you argue that um, truths may get in the way. It, it implies that the ambition to reconstruct what actually happens in reality, so to try to transform this peace negotiations into a historical seminar figuring out what was actually happening is a misleading approach and multi most likely unachievable, which for example was the case when the European Union tried to draft a preamble for the European Constitution coming up with a story of, with a short story of, of Europe, which of course didn't work and didn't convince anybody and couldn't serve this purpose. At the same time, um, you have the problem that you still want to make a difference between mere fabrication brought forward only to achieve specific political goals. So you still rely on something like, well, this is an implausible kind of reconstructing the history, whereas this is kind of more plausible. And I, and I wonder how you deal with, with this tension between, on the one hand, denying the, the possibility of reconstructing a true account, and, and on the other hand, accepting multiple, multiple realities, but not any version of story. So, and I, I, yeah, how do you deal with that? Well, the first point, I think, uh, you know, uh, writing a history of Europe is indeed an extremely difficult thing. And, and before you know it, everybody's claiming that you've left them out. You've given more attention to one and the other. And, and we're not even talking about two or ten different interpretations. In this case, we're talking about dozens. Not only the number of states, but within those states also all the different... So uh, that, is, that is a given. 
Um, and the, the kinds of, uh, of situations that we're talking about, of course, are not, not identical to that. Uh, but the dilemma that you, that you point out is, is the crux of the matter. And so your question in, in that respect is, is extremely pertinent. This is precisely the difficult thing that, uh, about how do you address this with the people in the room. It is very different to address this in terms of a, a paper, um, a thesis, um, which, is a, which does not involve individuals uh, loaded with, with tension and emotion. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, in each case, I think a different strategy needs to be thought about, and some might be uh, more in the way of having a working group that discusses this not in the main room of the negotiations, but perhaps in a parallel process. It could involve scholars. And some of these things uh, have sometimes been done, not so much in the past to address the question I'm trying to address, which is how the negotiators relate to their historical perceptions, but more how the community at large does. But of course, that also, hopefully, in the longer term, has some impact on uh, on leadership and on, on the negotiators as well. So there is, there is some, um, uh, some practice to draw from, um, but, but it remains an extremely difficult and touchy one. And this is one of the reasons that I think that um, it is important to start thinking about how one would train people to do this, this sort of discussion, to lead this sort of discussion, to arrange this sort of discussion. Question. Oh, yes, if you can, you have the microphone. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, you, men you mentioned emotions uh, in the negotiators at one point, and um, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but whether emotions were useful or if they were to be pushed down. Because I see emotions as wonderful indicators. And below emotions is usually what's driving them and the longings. So when you facilitate the transformations, do you, do you actually let those emotions point to what is really valued underneath, what I call universal needs? Um, let me see how I can best answer that. I, um, the first part of your question, which is what I meant or what I, what I had said, I don't, uh, uh, I don't th the approach does not involve repressing or bringing out emotions. Um, it involves understanding that they are there and trying to address uh, the underlying some, one, I'm just talking about one aspect. There are emotions about lots of other things as well. I'm just talking about the historical perspective and how, how that affects the way that negotiators behave. Um, and, uh, and yes, the, the whole approach is to understand what lies beneath it and to allow that to be expressed in a way that hopefully as I mentioned, doesn't need to be agreed upon or accepted by the other party, but acknowledged. Um, and possibly, and that's the question that you just put, possibly as valid, uh, as a valid way of seeing things, but one that we don't necessarily agree on. Uh, but not always, because there are some extreme cases where one does not expect uh, um, that it can be expected, uh, accepted as valid. So, and that is, that is where the difficulty is that you mentioned. There's a question on that side. Just wait a moment, the microphone comes your way. Thank you, Michael, for the insightful lecture. Um, since you're an expert on the Tibetan issues, I'll just have a specific question on that negotiation there. And in your lecture, you mentioned, say, during that negotiation between the Tibetan government in exile and the Beijing uh, regime, the Beijing uh, side uh, holds this uh, absolute and exclusive uh, narrative on, Ch on Tibet has been part of China from uh, since ancient times. Um, but according to some media coverage, and uh, I'd like to see, uh, hear your correction if this is wrong, According to some media coverage, uh, Dalai Lama is not seeking independence from China now. 
uh, I just wonder why then there's a moderate and um, sort of a, a stance uh, cannot be accepted by the Beijing, Beijing government. And also in your opinion, what is both sides should it do to move these things forward? Thank you. Thank you, not an easy question. Um, but an important one, but let me just point out the negotiations or the discussions, the dialogue, which is the word that has been used, that has taken place now for uh, quite a long time between uh, representatives uh, of the Dalai Lama and the Chinese government, are not uh, officially are not between the uh, exile government or the Central Tibetan administration and the Chinese government, but they are very specifically uh, at the, uh, and this is very important to the Chinese government, are uh, between the Chinese government and representatives of the Dalai Lama, just so that we're clear on that. Um, and this, at this moment, may, may in fact be an issue that, that will come up, and, and it's interesting to see what might happen. Um, uh, I think, yes, one can categorically state that not only the Dalai Lama, but also the Tibetan administration in exile, in other words, the, lead, the Tibetan leadership in exile, has taken a very clear stand, which is we are not demanding independence, but a form of genuine autonomy. And a very extensive memorandum was written and published uh, in which uh, is described precisely what that autonomy would entail. And it's an autonomy that is not that different from some of the examples that I gave at the, at the end of the, uh, of the lecture and that have been used in many parts of the world. Um, and so it would, it, one would think that this is a, region, a reasonable um, basis on which to uh, have a dialogue. Um, and it is, uh, to me also, it is very difficult to understand why the dialogue is not moving forward. Um, unless the explanation lies in differences of opinion, and this happens in other places as well, differences of opinion within uh, the Chinese government and the Communist Party leadership, that perhaps the government is not ready to embark uh, on this kind of really substantive discussion. Uh, but on the other hand, the example that I gave may also be one of the reasons uh, why it isn't moving forward. Perhaps a Last question, over there. Uh, if I could just take a step further from where Alan Kassoff had begun with us, uh, he had cited the kinds of national historical memories uh, as, as uh, problematical. We have particularly around the conflicts in the Middle East a religiously driven, can't even call it history, religiously driven sets of narratives where uh, truth or untruth by any historical measure is almost irrelevant, whether we're talking about uh, the different strains of Islam in Syria and the Christians there, or the mother of all such conflicts, Israel, Palestine, and such. So uh, if you could tell us whether this formula that you've described in dealing with kind of ethnic or identity group uh, politics in, in terms of historical narratives is actually more amenable to trying to understand mutual narratives or hopeless when you're dealing with ancient religious codes that people have been drilled in their heads to accept unquestioningly. Uh, this would seem to be far harder than who runs which islands off the east or southern coasts of China. Very good question. Thank you. I, I, uh, I am not an expert on the Middle East. But from what I, I observe, what I read, what I talk to people about, um, I would think that your, what I sense is your conclusion that you're presenting is, is entirely true. Um, I think uh, trying to um, uh, apply this kind of approach to the, the, the types of deep set religious beliefs of people um, is a lot more difficult than it would be in the, um, uh, in the identity-based type of conflicts that I'm talking about. Where typically the um, historical narratives that we're talking about are, um, have to do with people's perception of where they come from. Um, they're very often, they're linked to a particular territory. Uh, wanting to, in many cases, 
where we're not talking about the state side, but the non-state actor, it is simply a recognition that they too have a right to their own history. And this is particularly strong if this has been denied for some time for whatever political and other reasons, and it happens, it happens everywhere. I mean, it happens very frequently. And so there's a kind of cropped up anxiety and, and anger very often that can be given an outlet if the other side simply accepts and acknowledge that that may be another way of looking at history and you acknowledge that that is legitimate too and our way of looking at history is as well and perhaps we should give your history more importance than we have in our, in our national narrative or in our state na narrative. There's also, um, and I didn't go into this, there is also with this whole notion of the, of the nation state there's also this assumption or this promise that the state and the nation is the same thing. Um, and we all know that there's very few states that are actually a, a single nation state. Um, and so this complicates it because you're suggesting that it's the same thing. A, a, a state's history becomes a national history but it not, isn't really and thereby excludes another nation possibly or another people or another group. And so there's a lot of confusion I think that, that results also simply from our use of these terms that don't really reflect the reality, but reflect, in effect, a promise that is not, you know, that's not fulfillable most of the time. Um, and that's also the, the, the point that I was trying to make, that um, we are, in a sense, encouraging groups to seek independence, is because we're not, we don't have, if you like, a sufficient arsenal of alternatives to work with uh, to give different needs uh, different, uh, different structures, um, and uh, and history is just you know trying to accommodate uh, their desire for recognition of history is just one of these aspects. Uh, but I, I should say that this, in some cases, it is the state that is more insistent on having its version of history recognized than it is the non-state actor, and that sometimes is more complicated to understand since they have, if you like. Um, the power side of the equation in, in the asymmetric relationship. Uh, but that too exists, and I have seen uh, very senior people, ministers in, in, in governments, get emotionally extremely angry at a uh, relatively so much weaker um, insurgency, if you like, uh, for not accepting their version of history. So it, it, it does exist on both sides. Well, thank you, Michael, for uh, sharing these kind of long-term uh, admirable ambitions and frustrations. And of course, we all wish you also great luck in, uh, in the invisible part of your, uh, your life where you actually are trying to achieve that. I think you definitely were successful in your short-term goals, which is uh, starting uh, a discussion, a dialogue here uh, tonight at this conference. And you will be here uh, for the next uh, couple of years. To, and we hope we continue on campus this. Now I propose that we continue the discussion uh, in the common room at Fult Hall with, uh, with uh, some food and drinks. Uh, but we, only before I invite you to join me, to thank Michael again for this wonderful lecture. Thank you very much.